What's Love Supreme is a production of iHeartRadio. All right, ladies and gentlemen, do not attempt to adjust your dial. I'm so old school, of course, I would say a dial as if it was a radio. We learned on a previous episode of Quest Love Supreme, you got to follow the light. And so we're doing something rather different. Um, this is going to be a one on one interview. And, um, you know, oftentimes we, we just have to, you know what? Okay, normally I would do our, my normal jargon of, you know, we have greatness in the room and da-da-da-da-da, but I feel that's a lot of pressure sometimes. So I will just simply say that uh, this is an episode of two friends, two colleagues, having a conversation with each other. And uh, I don't know, it's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a conversation with the one and only, how do I describe him? Andre Lauren Benjamin, aka Three Stacks. Shit, he's so enlightening, he might be four stacks right about now. AKA Johnny Vulture, Sonny Bridges. <laughs> ah, I forgot about those. <laughs> yeah, they just chipped out. The, the nicest Gemini I know. Like, he, he's the exception to my no Gemini's rule. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, come on now. No, but you're Gemini's, May, man. You're you're May Gemini though, so you know I like to think you're more Taurus adjacent than June Gemini's. I don't know. I I don't I don't get along with many June Gemini's. So Gemini's crazy, man. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, yeah, you are, are all man. crazy, but so crazy that you're just into it. Like whatever we into, we crazy about it. Yeah. No, you guys are bold. I mean, look, dude. Our, our hero prince is is a gemini yeah man. so many gemini's out there yeah um so yeah i, I want to do something a bit different because i know you're on a press run and i know when an artist does a press run where you just do an interview after interview after interview after interview the muscle memory kicks in you're answering the same exact questions over mm -hmm, and over again mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i kind of want to use this as an opportunity to actually to get to know you as a human all right, let's stretch then. Yeah, and so I'm. Yeah, I'll say that I'm taking a three thousand approach in in Questlove Supreme Land, and I'm going to throw out questions that uh, I wouldn't typically ask on a QLS episode. <laughs> and um, uh oh, no, 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 this, this is going to get fun. Yeah, I assure you, I assure you, it's that. So I'll, my first question to you is, what time do you wake up in the morning? Just automatically, not like on the clock. I got to get to the airport, but what's your body clock? When do you wake up? About uh, about eight eight a.m. Maybe like naturally, about eight a.m. Naturally eight a.m. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a morning routine? What do you do in the first half hour of your day? <laughs> like I've never used social media, so I've I've never had a Twitter account. I only had a, have an Instagram account now to preserve my name but i've never ever posted anything in my life mm -hmm. so it's funny that when i see most people in the world and they're constantly checking their instagram like you know kind of going through these little things so when i get up in the morning i have my tv set up to uh like i'm a youtube person man like youtube is my university so i just watch a whole bunch of shorts just random random shorts i guess it's the same thing someone would do scrolling through instagram but um yeah, I kind of get thrown stuff um, from the YouTube al alga. Okay. Where do you live? I live in Venice Beach. I live a few blocks up from here. I live in Venice Beach, California. How long have you lived out in Venice? About four, four or five years now, maybe. So was yeah. there every time you lived in New York? Yeah, I lived in New York for four years before I came here. So uh, I lived in Atlanta. Lived in Dallas uh, for two years, then I moved to New York for about three years, maybe, and then then moved here. I heard a crazy rumor. Are you a fishing 
aficionado? No, um, I started going deep sea fishing. Like my family took me deep sea, deep sea fishing, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I invited Big Boy on a on a couple of them, and Big Boy, like he's been running with it. Like Big Boy goes out and deep sea fishes all the time now. So I think you may be confusing me with Big Boy. Well, I I heard that someone told me like in Long Island once that you like I saw Andre three thousand like going fishing in Long Island. I was like, Long Island? He's not from New York. And it's like, yeah, he's from New York. So, you, Oh, no. <laughs> no. What do young people say? That's Cap. Okay. <laughs> That's a good rumor, nah, though. Nah, That's I mean, a good rumor, though. <laughs> I mean, fishing is, is awesome. You know, I, nah, just, I, I've never done it in Long Island, though. No. Okay. Um, and these are also non sequitur and, and random questions. No, I love these kind of questions. Like, right. you're interviewing me like a- Like, like a human. I, I, well, when we go to Europe- yeah. They ask different questions. Exactly. You know what I mean? I, I like the different. Well, I figure answers. you're just tired of asking the same thing. Where have you been? Did I, you know, how many instruments do you play, or can you play? I can mess around with maybe four or five to get a sound out of them, but I don't even consider myself a musician in that way. Like I can't even claim that uh, I know real musicians. You know. Um, but I can write. I use them as kind of like writing too. Sometimes I can record myself doing it, but uh, I'm not proficient. I'm probably more prof- proficient on uh, flute than I am on any of them. So in a world full of instruments, why the flute? Natural, how I got there, uh, how I discovered it. With instruments, you kind of, you pick them up and you mess around with them and you start to see where am I spending most of my time? And it ended up being being the flute. But then I go through phases too, because I was I did it with guitar for a little bit, then I did it with bass for a little bit. And then uh, flute just happened to be the thing that I think stuck. And because I think the mobileness of a flute too, because I mean, right now I'm holding the flute. I, I carry it kind of everywhere. So any inspiration I get, I just pick it up and start messing around. I can't do that with a bass guitar. I can't do that with a piano. I, you can do it with a guitar, acoustic maybe, but... This is so unassuming and you just kind of carry it like a, you know. So I think that uh, the portability of a flute probably made it my my favorite. How many do you own? About 30, 30 flutes maybe. Um, so you have 30 versions of that? Uh, no, and they're all from different makers. But um, this style of flute, I, I probably own more of these and my double flutes than any any other style. Because it's kind of the flute that I really fell in love with with first which is is based in like um, Mesoamerican culture, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Mayan and Aztec flutes. And now this is the Native American version of them made by Guillermo. Uh, They were made of clay originally, but um, I I own a lot of these, but I think once I started to go on the flute path, I started to get schooled by Uber drivers uh, because I play all the time. So I play in Ubers, I play in cab, I play in the back. (laughs) Word. Yeah. And so if I'm playing and it's, a Chinese driver, he'll turn around like, oh, man, that reminds me of my country. Or if it's Japanese, oh, that reminds me. Or if it's African, oh, it reminds me. So everybody, I'm playing the same flute, but every nationality of driver will turn around and tell me it reminds them of their country. So that let me know that culturally, every culture has a flute. Okay. And, and a drum, of course. But yeah, but I started to uh, get schooled uh, on the street and by Uber drivers, by people asking me about things. Like I was in Philly. Uh, shooting the film and I spent a lot of time in Philly and I was just walk and play and this dude comes up to me and he's like oh you're doing that Japanese thing and I was like what Japanese thing are you talking about and then he schools me and tell me that there was a whole shakuhachi culture where you know these Japanese players would walk around with baskets on their head to have no identity and no ego and just play for people that was it and I would just walk around in public and play so he was asking me was I doing that which I had no idea what that was and went to research that and learned about that. I was going to say, um, there's a show that came on uh, in the 70s called Kung Fu. Yes. <laughs> and of which uh, David Carradine's character sort of, and he, Tarantino sort of alluded to that in Kill Bill, in mm-hmm. which he played the same exact flute, like just walk around and start yeah. playing. And Okay. So yeah, I was wondering like, wow, I wonder if he's in his Kung Fu phase. No, it's, he- it's just, uh, just, I'm being taught, I'm learning and... I see now that anything that I can blow wind through and manipulate the notes with my fingers, I want to play it. So if I'm turned on to a uh, Persian nay flute or a uh, Indian Bansuri flute or uh, um, like a gourd, a Chinese gourd, like I just like discovering things that I can blow. 
you know, and it's and it's fun, how you know. Long, Pause. How long did it take? <laughs> how long did it take? How long did it take you for muscle memory's sake to? I get the feeling you're going to say I have yet to master the flute, but oh yeah, man. No. I mean, but you do know, like, and right now when you're playing, are your hands telling you what to do, or do you know that this particular position will yield this note and that note and no, that's the fun and scary part about how I play. Like uh, when people hear the record, like we made it up as it was going. So I'm discovering that melody as it's going along. But I don't know what I'm doing until I do it. So like I couldn't, I, like if you played a note for me right now on a keyboard, I could not tell you what that note was. If okay. you played a chord, I couldn't tell you. I, see, I understand when musicians talk about a key center or you know, the bottom of this court, but I don't know what that is. None of that is for, so for me, it's all physical mm -hmm. and it's all shapes. So I do know if I take one finger and spread, I, I can't say it on the microphone or how to say it, but do these ET kind of fingers. I know that gives me an odd note. That's all I know. I okay. know, I know it's odd, which may be a, some, I don't know, a flat or something. Mm -hmm. And I know if I put all my fingers down, I get a certain thing. So when I'm playing, I'm actually responding to what note I just played before, not knowing what that note is. So everything is on a tightrope. So you take one one step at a time. Purely one step at a time, but it but it is it is very physical. It is very physical because I'm trying to wheel something out because I know I never trained. So I have to find another way, another route to get to it. How often do you practice a day? I wouldn't even call it practice, which I'm now getting in, into practice. Like, because I started playing flute, like I'm actually meeting like kick-ass flute players. Like someone introduced me to Shabaka. And so Shabaka will show me exercises. Like I'm, but I've never done that before. And so I'm learning how to practice. I never went to college or anything. So I don't even have like the, um, I, I, I just never had to study. Right. So I don't have that in me. It's all, for me, it's always playing. I just try to play as much as possible, which ends up being study. So e even before, I'm, I'm just always out playing, but I don't know, I don't have a regimen really. You know, fun fact: that's you're speaking for at least seventy percent of all musicians out there. Like, I play by ear. Yeah, I mean, I've just recently, maybe in the last twenty years, and only because like some of the more intellectual roots will eye roll because I don't know, I didn't know previously how to say. Like play a, a C sharp sus. Yeah. You know, or See, I know, I know those words, but that's so that's foreign to me. Right. But for yeah. a majority of creatives, there there's two types of musicians: technical musicians and musicians that feel. I'm a feel musician. Mm -hmm, totally feel. Like if you were to put notate notes in front of me, I wouldn't know what the hell yeah. is in front of me. So I got to yeah. go on feel. Yeah, that's all I have, man. That's all I kind of and and the thing about hip hop too, hip hop forces you to do the immediate thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just certain energy that, uh, yeah, I don't know. We just kind of have this kind of flying by the seat of our pants kind of thing. And so when I put it towards an instrument, I'm kind of transferring it in that way of, like, we just try stuff. Like, we pick up something that's not supposed to be for a thing and make it for something else. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm using a lot of that. How did you assemble the musicians for new blue sun how did it how did it come together uh it naturally came about by me meeting uh carlos uh carlos nino yeah okay. um we met it's, it's such a venice venice story we met in air one <laughs> yeah no joke no joke we met it we yeah, met I like in their <laughs> and uh actually uh mike d from beastie boys was there at the meeting because i saw him in line checking out and i went up to him what's up man you know and then Carlos comes up. So it's three of us standing right here at the cash register. Right. And Carlos uh, invites us out to an event that he's doing that night. And uh, yeah, we kind of started hanging out since then. Um, he had heard that I was in town in Venice and people were like, I think y'all need to meet, you know. And so oh, people okay. would say that to Carlos. And Carlos was like, yeah, I'm going to meet him, you know, at some point, you know. And we finally ended up meeting. And um, he invited me over to his house. Uh, mm -hmm. We recorded in his garage. And that was kind of like our first kind of getting into it. And I knew I wanted to work on this wind project. And uh, I knew a lot of the sounds that I was looking for. Uh, that's what that's what Carlos does. And so when he was brought into the fold, he's like, man, I know a lot of people I could bring, you know, to help. 
And so we tried out a lot of different outfits, you know, different mm-hmm. situations. And the core four of us um, ended up kind of ended up being the, Surya and the, Nate as yeah, well. Yeah, Surya and Nate. And, mm-hmm. But that ended up being the core. And then we would invite just anybody in to come and, you know, hang out. But yeah, this album definitely, it, it couldn't have been made without Carlos Nino. Like Nino is, what I love about Nino is he reminds me of, when I was producing early on for Outkast, like there's a certain excitement. Like he's more concerned with what's the most interesting thing. Okay. You know, and I, I love that. It's like a kind of kid spirit, you know? So, okay, in the credits of the album, under Carlos's title, there's also, play, like it's listed as gongs, various instruments, and then there's plants. Mm-hmm. How are plants a part of the instrumentation? Of this album, um, I mean, you'll see when we when we play live, but uh, sounds are everywhere, man. Should like anything is anything is a sound. You know, we've only settled on certain instruments because we're used to them. But like Carlos may just grab a palm leaf off the, off the side of the road and shake it. Oh, okay, I see. I see. You know what I mean? So I get. It. Anything like it could be a beanstalk, a dry big, anything you I know, see. just whatever makes a cool noise that you like. And and Carlos has like man, and a myriad of sounds of stuff, anything like, yeah. And plants happen to be one of. Them. So, what's the division of labor as far as the the technical aspect? I'm only asking this because um, when I read the credits to your album, there's a name there, a legendary Philadelphia name. Um, gentleman named Andy Kravitz. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Andy mastered this album. Yes. Now, Andy Kravitz, to me, <laughs> is a very legendary Philadelphia native. Trauma. We got our record deal in 1993. I used to intern at Ruffell's Records. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Andy Kravitz was sort of like a house producer at Studio 54. So I'm there like when he's working with Tim Dog. Um, he's played on Steady B stuff. And so I, you know, he was like really the first hip hop drummer I've seen with my own eyes. N- nothing. Sorry, Full Bobby circle. Simmons of, of Stetson Sonic. Forgive me. But yeah, Andy Kravitz, the first, like, and then he just disappeared off the radar for like 20. And I always wondered what happened to him. So yeah. he's mastering. Yeah. It's, it's so cool that, uh, the relationship like Carlos ha- has worked with him before. And okay. so. His mastering studio is in Venice, so it was all in the neighborhood. So, like, his mastering studio is right by the beach, and we just kind of go to his house, and he got, like, crazy equipment, like, knee boards, and a little bit of ass apartment. It's awesome. Like, So, basically, I have to move to Venice? Uh, I, I, Why Venice? I have no idea, man. Like, I got here at happenstance, like... I wasn't even supposed to be living in Venice, and then this real estate agent lady, and she was like, hey, check out this little house I got in Venice. I mean, it's... Just check it out. And all my friends in LA, they were like, please, man, don't move to Venice. Like, all right. LA people be like, man, we'll never see you because that's on the west side. That's way. Yeah, there. I was going to say it's beautiful. But then I was like, ah, man, so much on Sunset and all my favorite restaurants. I would never. No, I'm not. But, doing I, but I never get back on that side, though. Like, everything I need is pretty much over here. And I think all of that, like, me moving to Venice catapulted me in the direction I needed to go. And I will say that because I, I met, I went to a breathwork class in Venice. Mm-hmm. That's when I first heard this certain kind of flute that I love. And it was all because of Venice. So I have to say sometimes them certain breadcrumbs or wherever you're, wherever you are, are for a reason. And you may not even know it at the time, but mm-hmm. if I didn't move to Venice, uh, this album probably wouldn't have been made. Okay. Not in this way. What was the... Banner year or the starting year of your flute curiosity? Uh, I don't know the actual starting year, uh, but I will say, because me and Carlos were just talking about it the other day. Since the love below, I've been interested in wind instruments. Like I've messed around with saxophone, even on like, and uh, she lives in my life at the, at the end, the horrible saxophone, that's me messing around with saxophone. Oh, I thought you had a free jazz saxophone player. Like, no, nah, that's me. That's me. That was you? Yeah, that's me playing. That's me oh, messing shit. around. I have to re-listen to that. Okay. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. But it was like <laughs> Is it though? I don't believe in wrong notes. And yeah. I love yeah. now I gotta go back and listen again. No, you, but you hear it. You hear it. 
The thing is, if you do it with a straight face and confidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's always for real. Now, it's serious. If it, even if it's horrible, you're going to believe it. <laughs> okay. I just thought you had some free jazz. Okay. Now, now I have to revisit that. So, so yeah, I, I started wanting to play saxophone, first tenor saxophone, because of John Coltrane. I mean, because I was a fan of John Coltrane and me reading bios of John mm-hmm. Coltrane, I learned that he played clarinet in school first mm-hmm. before he switched over to... So I was like, well, let me give me a clarinet. So I bought a clarinet, straight uh, B-flat, the straight one, mm-hmm. uh, B-flat clarinet, and I played around with it for a few months. And then we were on tour, and I went to a pawn shop in New York. Mm-hmm. And there was a Selmer bass clarinet. I don't know why I was there, and I was like, this it looked cool. A lot of times I'm attracted to an instrument because of the way it looked. Mm-hmm. And so I saw it, and it was in its case. It was open, and it happened to be like a 1967 Selmer bass clarinet bought it and as soon as i started playing it like and the thing is with uh wind players it's a thing called armature it's kind of like how your mouth fits over the tip of the uh, the reed mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff it's weird but i was just blessed to immediately have an armature like my first time picking it up and putting my mouth on it was like yeah. I'm, I'm getting a good tone like a good sound so it it uh motivated me to even want to play more you know so from there uh once I hit the bass clarinet, I noticed that I love the the deeper tones and I love wind on wood mm-hmm. uh, compared to metal, which is, you know, uh, soprano or, which yeah, I tried a little soprano too. Okay. Uh, so from there, it's just me loving what I could get out of wind instruments. So I even got into oboe, which is the hardest one to play. Like, I love the oboe sound. Um, got into oboe, went into oboe day, uh, oboe day. Which right. is, yeah, Oboe Day at the new school, they have like Oboe Day. Uh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Uh, like Dre Day, but Oboe Day. Right. Okay. I was like, is that a pun or? Okay. <laughs> no. Nah, Oboe so, Day. I get it. So yeah, when I moved to New York, um, I would just kind of look at the school schedule of whatever performances were at the new school, because I always like to go where the youth is performing new music. I don't care. Like there's something about that college age where you're dumb enough to try new things but you are developed enough to do them well. And mm-hmm. that's that. It's, it's about that that period. And so I would just go to the new school and see whatever recitals are playing. I don't care, piano one night, it could be bassoonist another night or a whole orchestra. And I just sit there and listen. And Side question, are you freaking people out as you're like just wandering into their school? Not really. Cause or I mean, into their pawn shop? <laughs> no, nah, I just, you know, talk to the students. You know, they'd be like, oh, he came to the show. or But it would be maybe... 15 people in there, like 10 people just sitting. Okay. So it was it was not like a big production or anything, so I could easily just slip in and slip out. But just my, my interest in wind instruments uh, just kept growing. And so I would just collect different uh, wind instruments, and then I discovered uh, the Guillermo, um, the Maya double flute, mm-hmm. which is kind of what really pushed me into wanting to play it all the time. And maybe, like even with a bass, bass clarinet, you have to, it's like a gun, you have to construct it put it together, put it back in the case, clean it, you know. Mm-hmm. With these, it was so instant, I could just carry it around. So it was it was very instant, and I think because I could carry it, I kept it with me longer than any other instrument. So, yeah, I've been interested in wind for a long time, but... Um, okay. Yeah. So this album marks a return to the spotlight uh, for you for the first time in, uh, uh, as of this recording, 17 years. Uh, basically meaning you haven't released product with your name on it since 2006. Um, My own product, yes. Your own product, yeah. Right. Even though you've done uh, things here and there. Uh, could you describe, if you can go back that far, 2007? Like a year what's, after... What's 2007? Well, a year after 2006 where you know, you're know you starting your... I'm sure then you didn't think of it as, I'm going to start my exile or my rest from my day job that people know me from but like a year or two after it when you're not in daily motion of gotta have an album out gotta figure out a tour gotta da da like yeah yeah what what was 2007 like for you you were 32 years old um i i don't remember but that's cool too. Uh, yeah, because I, I, it's hard for me to place the dates. Like I, I you have to give me kind of like a, like a, a marker. That's like right. that was a year after the Love Below came out, or a year before 
Idlewild, or like I kind of have to mark. I think a year after Idlewild came out in two thousand six, so I say a year after Idlewild. Then Uh, a year after Idlewild, um, at home, and I I was blessed to start getting asked to be on remixes. Okay, and that was a blessing for me because it gave me a chance to rap. You know, after all that had happened, so weird. You see it as a blessing. Like, no, because it feel good to rap. So whenever you get the, like the op- opportunity to do it and you in it, like, I know. Yeah. But like, okay, so I remember once when you appeared on the remix of uh, "Walk It Out." Walk it out, Walk right? It out. Yeah, yeah. And the so I know you're not on social media, so to see the social media reaction to you even being on that remix, one was a shocker. Like, wait, Andre three thousand is on a "Walk It Out" song and with Jim Jones, whatever. So, but. It was such a mind blowing thing, but in my mind, I was like, "Wow, I wonder if he notices like that." And again, I mean this with no pressure, no intent of pressure. Like you're kind of holding the world's oxygen supply, you know, hostage because you could spit a verse, and it's guaranteed that at least three things that you say in that verse will be like, "Holy shit!" You hear a couple of those words again? Like it's it's an event. I've seen people like. For instance, the verse on the Rick Ross thing. Mm. Like, I didn't think I'd ever experience coming from a place where we would have daily meetings about, wait, wait, what about this? And then you just start doing your PowerPoint thing and the way he juxtaposed these words together. <laughs> but, oh, man. So it's just weird to hear you say, like, oh, I'm just so blessed to be able to get the opportunity to do that. And I'm like, no. And when I you say, you are the opportunity. No, <laughs> but see, when I say blessing, you got to understand too. This is a town, a, a town creating a new sound too. So DJ Unk, like it actually came through another DJ friend of mine that no Unk and Unk just said, "Hey, ask Andre if he would get on this beat," and it came that way. It was no, it was nothing, no big production. Like I don't even know if I got paid for the song. Like I think, um, I think the trade off was, "Hey Unk, can you do a couple of beats that we scratch bet- in in the background of my cartoon? That'll be the payment." For class uh, for class of three thousand, right? Okay. So okay. I I think it was set up that way, but the beat was so jamming, right? That you just want to get on it. So I say the blessing because any rapper just want to be on a good beat and be in the city. You know, you just want to be out. You want to be heard. So right. if producers are making new sounds, or even like even later like new artists, so so even if a Frank Ocean says, "Hey, get on my song," Frank Ocean, the new artist, I don't know him, mm-hmm. like get on my song. But when I say a blessing. That reintroduced me to a whole nother generation too, right? Okay. You know what I mean. I was following that, you right. know. So I do look at it as, as blessings, and I say blessing because we just come off of uh, Speaker Box Club Below, Idlewild, which was a musical, more focused, mm-hmm. melodic kind of thing, and so I didn't rap a lot. Okay. In in those offerings, a little bit. So when I say a blessing, it gave me another opportunity to. Do what I enjoy doing. Yeah. What five albums can you not live without? What five albums can you not live without? That's a hard pressure. One, man. Yeah, yeah. You should have <laughs> gave me some time to answer this before we got on this microphone, man. But the uh, thing is, I think oftentimes when you when people are in this high pressure situation of like, I gotta give the most intellectual answer. Like some, sometimes I listen to boring ass shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm on an Elvis kick right now because I just saw the Lisa Marie biopic. Okay. And I'm interested in that '68 comeback, black leather. So I'm, and plus, you know, the 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 Wrecking Crew were playing on that record. So right now I'm on an Elvis kick. Okay. For some strange reason, but it doesn't have to be five. I've, like, I've gone through that Elvis kick too. Really? Yeah, man. Like Elvis was a bad motherfucker, man. Like, or what five albums would you not expect us to think that you're into? Hmm, not think that I'm into. Uh, that's another thing because when you say your five albums, it's almost like I'm trying not to give you the ones that everybody's going to say too. So I'm 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 double thinking. Like if I say, you know, you know, Love Supreme, so like, right, you right. know what I mean? It's kind of like. <laughs> That's everybody's. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to figure out. That's a good question. What? what? Okay. So everyone has a, a go-to song that they put on 
to just calm them down. And yo, when the album came out, I hit you with 12 paragraphs. I'm certain the whole <laughs> world was hitting you with paragraphs. But, you know, okay, I won't say an album because what's an album in 2023? What music, what's your go to music that you escape to? Uh, it's different phases, man. And uh, just like you're saying right now, you're into an Elvis phase. Mm-hmm. Right now, um, I'm into uh, like a, a kind of a classical Steve Reichish kind of. Oh, okay. It's very uh, repetitive, calming, and meditative at the same time, but at the same time, like very complex and moving. It's like, and it's rhythmic, mm. you know, it's tight, you know. So I, I guess I'm into that. And I listen to um, like a lot of native drum circle music, like Cree Indian, Cree Nation kind of drumming, the way they sing, man. Yeah, that just that just blows my mind. Some something very powerful. Okay. About that. Is there any lyric that is ever stuck in your head? A stanza or a lyric of any song or I've been, I've been working on this slide documentary for so long that I think I almost every day hear the last line of family fear like you can't cry because you look broke down but you're crying away because you're all broke down so that's that's yeah. stuck in my head like yeah. are there lyrics that are often just stuck in your head even if it's dumb i met her in a hotel lobby met like anything like the song fast car by tracy chapman like is one of those songs that i wish you know people ask you man what song do you wish you do you wish written? you wrote yeah like as, as a child hearing that song it, it, it introduced me to Oh, you can you can actually hit people in the heart with words, you know. Right. And when she when she said the line, um, uh, something like uh, "is body body's too young for body's too old for working, but body's too old too young to look like his." My mama went off and left him. She wanted more than he could give. Somebody's got to take care of him. So I quit school. I was like, whoa, <sighs> yeah. You wish you wrote that. Yeah, it was like. We like we were we were listening and watching a real life. Like it's almost like the black, the black kind of um, trailer park story. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like right, right. And you okay. and you you were on the ride the whole time, like these big dreams of her and this dude, and someone running away from a past life, or, and, it, and it went full circle. Right, like she had these big dreams, just like her mama did. Then at the end, she got to keep moving. Like whoa, right. Hard. Okay. Yeah. Any anyone that's ever asked me like what song that I wish I wrote or a part of, I will never hesitate to say. Nothing will ever be the moment in which we were in our tour bus. We had one week to finish our Things Fall Apart album. Mm-hmm. We were coming mm-hmm. back from Pittsburgh. And this is August of ninety of ninety eight. Okay. And you know, back in the day, of course, your album had to be done like three months ahead of time. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. So somehow my publicist was connected to Drew Dixon at Arista and had a copy of Equimini. Hmm. And the feeling of fear when Spodioli Dopolis just came on. I was like, fuck, they sound like a better band than we do. Like, and instantly I knew like every black university marching band, like this was going to be something I heard like forever. And I was like, damn, how come my ideas don't come to me like that, man? Like, what the fuck? How? You know, and plus it's very, it's, 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 it's rare in which you hear stream of conscious thinking. Mm, Black mm, people thinking, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and man, uh, that paralyzed me so goddamn much, man. Like I wish I don't know if I should say thank you or sorry. I like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it like, made me. It made me try harder, man. It, like, and I've yet to still create that. So, like in my mind, that's that's what I'm doing. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? It actually best piece of advice I would say came from Erica's grandmother. Erica would all Erica's grandmom would always say, 
anything, any problem, any issue that come up, she'd be like, ah, oh, keep on living. It'll happen to you. That was it. <laughs> yeah, just keep Did on you know living. what she meant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Keep yeah. on living. It'll happen to you. Yeah. Okay. And it's as simple as that. It's going to happen. Keep on living. It'll happen to you. If you can astral travel, if you can astral travel back to 1992, mm-hmm. and you were allowed, you today were allowed uh, a 20 second window to disrupt the timeline and talk to yourself. And I believe you were 17 in 1992. What would you tell yourself in those 20 seconds? This is like, like before first album. Like, 92, I consider that the beginning yeah. of the podcast. What would I tell myself? Um, get ready for the ride, man. Get okay. ready for a ride that you don't even know how to hold on. Because you can't even fathom what's going to happen. You know? Um, so I don't know if there's any, any more advice than that. Just get ready for the ride and just, yeah. Yeah, because there's, no, there's nothing to prepare you for. Because we can have plans, like as humans, we you know, you just want to rap. Okay. But those are kind of on the ground, you know, goals. But then there's a higher force that that takes you further, and that things that I couldn't even imagine, that I couldn't even think about. So really, just get ready for the ride. Um, most people, when they dream, they often have uh, themes that occur all the time. Yep. Uh, trains are always in my dream for at least the last thirty years. Trains are always in my dream. What is the prevalent theme of all of your dreams? Flying. You're always on a plane? No, I'm always flying. No plane. Neither. Do you have a fear of flying? No. Besides trains, and this is I, I, weird. I live, in a, I live in an apartment in New York, and I'm on the 73rd floor. Um, and people always ask all the time, wait, aren't you afraid to be up here? You know, that, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. But yet when I sleep, because um, I often believe that, times your brain can't register fantasy in real life Mm -hmm. so i tried an exercise where you know i was watching somebody on youtube and they said like imagine yourself flying and when i close my eyes to met like to stand on a ledge to make that leap i get that i I can't imagine myself even in my dreams i can't imagine myself flying over like it's it's the same fear as if i were on the ledge and want to hang on to dear life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in your dreams, you have the ability to just transport and fly. Yes. And it, and it was from wherever I am, like not a, I have to be on the top of a building. Like I can be on the ground and I start to do this type. It's, it's almost like a, a hover. Like it's like a floating kind of thing. And you're kind of like, it's not like, it's not like direct uh, control. It's almost like, you're drifting and you're able to manipulate the drift a little bit, but not fast. So if I want to make a turn, I got to start drifting a little. But yeah, like I'm always flying. I'm looking down on the world. Like I'm looking down on mountains. I'm looking down on things. But here's the craziest thing. Whenever I try to show my friends, like I remember in one dream, I was trying to show uh, show C-Law, like, see, look, man, check this out. And I tried to do it for him. It didn't work. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like you want to share. So when you this were thing. planning it, you couldn't do it. But when it just not when happens. I was when I was by myself and, and it was happening, I was whoa, look at this flying thing. And now at this point, I want to show people. You almost like I almost want to show off the trick. Like oh, check check this out. And whenever I try, it just doesn't work. Which is which is weird, you know. But but I have that dream a lot, and it's the same flying style. Which is and it's kind of like it's a really awesome style, because it's is because even in your dreams you're cool as shit. <laughs> nah, because it's, it's, it, it's so it's so floaty. It's so floaty. It's not like a plane ship where I'm able to make quick rights or anything. So it's almost like it's hard. <laughs> okay, I get try it. to describe dreams on a microphone. It's hard. Man. I get it. Like it's hard. Who are three of the most, in your career, who are three of the most important people that you've met? L.A. Reid, uh, who signed us, mm-hmm. big boy. And I, I just, I say third, I'd have to say collectively the dungeon. Those are the most important. Okay. You know, because 
and for for different reasons. But well, L.A. Reid, of course, he gave us our first opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, so he saw enough in us to sign us to give us an opportunity to do something. Uh, big boy, because he's my high school friend that started this whole thing with me. That oh, we we can do this, you know. Mm -hmm. And not only not only that, just contributing in like a music form, but in a motivational form too, because Big Boy knows me more than anybody and he knows, you know, when I'm not feeling a certain thing or, you know, when I've given up in a way. And Big Boy's always been kind of like the chili. Like I remember before we even first, our first album came out, our first showcase, uh, people didn't like us, you know, and we got the feedback from that showcase when all labels would come and you would do your act. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of funny to think about it now. But um, we got word that, you know, some feedback was, oh, they're okay. They're not stars. You know, that's, that was the feedback. And so at that point, I remember we were kind of sad. We were at the dungeon. And um, I was like, oh, well, well, shit, man. I'm going to go ahead and do this art thing like I always, like I, I thought I'd be drawing and painting. Like, that's what I started doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, the plan was like, all right, well, I'm just going to art school now. You know, this rap thing is not working. And so Big Boy is kind of the person like, no, man, we done came this far. Let's do it. So that value, uh, importance in, in my life and career. Um, the dungeon, uh, because they created an environment to show me, to well, to make me feel comfortable enough to do all the things that y'all are seeing now. Like, you have to have a, a good ground to, um, to feel comfortable enough to try stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. if yeah, I mean, you, you've seen it. You, you produce. You've been in the studio. Like, you've gotten certain things out of artists when they're open and, and you know freer than if they're you know nervous or you know they're scared to fuck up. Mm -hmm. You know, or scared to not be great. You know, you got to create that environment. And I think uh, the dungeon created that environment for me to, um, yeah, for me to know how to dream. Like they taught me. Like, yeah, they taught me how to get out. You know. What's the uh, hidden talent that you possess that the world doesn't know about? Drawing, uh, painting, sculpting. You still actively paint right now and sculpt? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Are you into selling your work? Yes, very soon. Stay tuned. Very soon. Yeah, I want to be for because that's I collect works from different artists. Yeah, man. So yeah. finally, George Clinton gave yeah. me an official piece and. Right. Yeah, man. I, I I can't wait to share it because it's a whole other thing. And I've been I've been sharing it a little bit. But only like on Outcast CDs, uh, yeah, all the little artwork. sketches, little quick, and that's that's another thing. That was uh, that was a big boy thing. Like I did it one time for the first album, and then Big Boy's like, "You gonna do another one for the next one?" I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" So it became a thing because so he you've done all that artwork of on the on actual the CD, disc? Yeah, yeah, on the yeah, disc. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's your work. Okay, yeah, and, I, and I'm I'm I call myself more of a uh, like a classroom drawer. More than mm -hmm. anything, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, full fledged. I'm learning how to paint now, but yeah, I've I've been doing it for a while now, and I'm loving that I'm finding what I am loving that I'm finding my style and can't wait to to share it. But that uh, I cook. How good? I have to cook, and you have to tell me. Like, but people that have had food, they they enjoy it, and I really be doing the same thing that my mom and my and my dad showed me, just recipes they showed me. So it's like, what's your go to jam? Salmon patties and cheese grits. Okay. Or uh or fried fish. Um my dad had a fish shop on Riverdale Road. Okay. Uh, and my mom taught me, you know, recipes. And I'm only child, so I cooked for myself a lot. So I had that skill to to do it. So Okay. Other talents, um I can make water noises with my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh you wanna hear? Hit me. Andre 3000, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> What's the greatest cereal of all time? Woo! I would have to say, you got to eat it quick. But them Fruity Pebbles, though, like... Oh, before yeah. it just yeah. becomes <laughs> super yeah, soggy. Yeah, yeah. Them Fruity Pebbles, man, they, uh, they something else. Okay. The story that you told me before we started taping mm. about... Coachella night one. Yeah, yeah, man. Could you share that story? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, and it's funny, for a long time, I, I wasn't sure if I, you know, when people pass away, you just want to kind of respect. Right. Um, but I think I think Prince would, um, 
I think he would enjoy it. So yeah, um, like I don't, I don't, I've met Prince in passing. Like when I was finishing up the love below, I lived in LA. Mm-hmm. And I remember me and a homie going out to a club uh on sunset, normal night. And I go, I say, hey, I'm going to use the bathroom. I'm walking away to use the bathroom. And this big, huge bodyguard dude comes and grabs me. He says, hey, Prince is in the corner. He wants to meet you. And so that was my first time meeting Prince when I got a pee. What year is this? Oh, man. This was... Um, well, you're making the love below. So that's... No, actually, this was Hey Y'all was already out. Hey, hey Y'all was out. Yeah. And that's the only... Like the whole Wait, album... You were just meeting him then? Out. No, the album had just come out. Right. Yeah. I, had, I hadn't met him before. Crap. I did yeah. not know that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All my friends had met him. You know, Erica told me stories. You know, I... I just, yeah. I never met him. But, um, so his bodyguard, I never mind you, I still got to pee. Right. <laughs> so I go over to this booth and this prince and he's sitting and, uh, I'm very nervous, man. He, you know, motions his hand, like sit down, sit down, man. You know, so I go and sit down and I just, I, I didn't know what to say. And he could, he could tell that I didn't know what to say. Right. So he was like, it's all good, man. He didn't say all good, but he was like, it's okay. Or something like that. He's like, it's okay. He's like, we don't have to talk about everything now. That's what we say. We don't have to say everything now. He's like, you can come out to Paisley Park. You know, you invite it, which I've never been to Paisley Park. But um, And so I'm sitting there, and I didn't... So he starts talking about Hey Ya. And I didn't know if it was... Did that freak you out? It did. That he knew you were alive, that you existed? Yes, but what he said, I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know if he was taking a dig at me or what, because he said... Yeah, uh, I like that song, Hey Ya, man. He was like, I thought I was the only person that did songs in those tempos. That's what he said to me. And I didn't know if he was like, mm, take that nigga, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't, I, I, I didn't know how to take it. You know, this is my hero. No, like, I think he considered you a peer. Like, I don't know. I don't know. And so naturally, the, the album had just come out and we were trying to figure out what's the next single. Right. And so I didn't know what to say to him. And I just said, hey, have you heard the album? He's like, yeah, I've heard it. And then he, and I said, well, what do you think the next single should be? Then he said another Prince thing. He said, in my day, we only had one shot. <laughs> so basically, he, basically he was saying, it don't matter now. Right. Whatever you do, it don't matter. Right. And I didn't know how to take that either. You know, it was like, okay, okay, cool. The next time I saw Prince, I'm, I'm, and it's always random. So I'm walking down the street, like close to Rodeo by myself, and a limo pulls up close to me. <laughs> I'm not, I swear to all the gods, man. No, dude, every Prince story is this random. Yes, I know, because I've heard them too. Yes. And so he, so this window rolls down, and this little head pops out, and it's Prince in a limo. And he said, What's up, man? I was like, What's up, man? You know, and then um, he was like, um, you heard about this? Some I can't say. I remember which magazine, but they would they opposed the thing. Oh, we want to put you and Prince on the cover of a magazine together. And Prince said, "You heard about that?" Uh, and I don't know if a rap page. I don't know what complex. I have no idea which magazine it was. But I was like, "Yeah, I heard about it." And I was asking him, "Like, what do you what do you think?" And he said, "Don't let them do you like that." Yeah, and I still that is you like a- said. <laughs> Like, I don't know, but, but now like in retrospect, I think what he meant was don't let them boil you down to being next to me. Right. You know what I mean? That's, that's what I got from it. Like, you know, you know what I mean? And people will try to put you in them boxes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I respected that from him. You know what I mean? He was like, you're more than whatever people are saying. You know what I mean? And that's what I that's what I took from so so fast forward. Yeah. I hadn't talked to him or seen him that whole time. Big boy done tour 10 years. Mm-hmm. So we have this Coachella opportunity. It's outcast 20 years. Wait, you must really be off the radar because Prince is super like I will see him in the most random situation. Yeah. So, so you're saying 10 years went by before you saw him again? Yeah, I think it was Seven to ten years. Maybe? Damn. Okay. Okay. But I, I'd moved from L.A. too, so okay. I only saw him in L.A. I think he was hanging out right. out here a lot. So the Coachella opportunity comes up. I was kind of like whatever about it. Like, you know, I was there were certain times I didn't even remember my raps. You know, I was just kind of like, all right, whatever. Let's go out here and do it. Mm-hmm. So the first night of Co- the first weekend of Coachella, um, 
nerves. Uh, like I hadn't been on stage. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's not my normal every day anymore. Mm-hmm. Big Boy does it every night. So this is normal to him. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming out the dressing room. Um, they start the show. I'm walking to the stage and I see Paul McCartney walk, oh, no. walk to the left side of the stage and sit. I saw Prince walk to the right side of the oh, stage no. and sit. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sorry, Andre, man. Yeah, so I'm you see sorry, what I'm man. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Tyler, the creator, just met us backstage. Uh, Tyler is new. I'm He's, sorry, we, man. We, talk, we talking. He came backstage. We tripping. All right. I'm nervous as fuck. I'm walking to the stage. Right. And I see these gods standing right. on both sides of the stage. Mind you, my whole career, I've never used in ears. You know, the right. monitors. We always just worked off of whatever speaker was on stage. Uh-huh. My first time ever using in ears, and they're acting up. So they're clipping out. I'm hearing people, voices I don't even know talking in my ear. I'm like, what the fuck? Right. So it was a disaster to me. Like, mm-hmm. I was trying to get through it. I didn't know how to do it anymore. Like, it was just a new awakening for an old thing that I used to do. So halfway through the show, um, I'm checked out. Like, I'm already just trying to get through it. I'm just trying to get through the night, you know. Uh, I'm already in my bed. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I walked off stage, I went home and went straight to sleep. When you when you crash, you go straight to sleep. <laughs> right. Like, it's like a bad night. So you just let me go to sleep and, you know, wake up in the morning. So when I woke up and I'm driving back to L.A., uh, my manager called and said, hey, Prince wants to talk to you. So he calls. I don't know where he got the number from. Yeah, he does um, yeah, so he, <laughs> he should work for like the Secret Service. Right, exactly. Like but um, he calls and it's Prince on the phone. I'm like, hey, man. I'm like, you know, I don't even know. Like, I'm, I got Prince on the fucking phone. Right. First thing he says, he says, you know what your problem is. He digs, he goes in straight like that. He said, you don't understand how big y'all are. And of course, I'm telling him my sob story like yeah man you know i ain't really been wanting to do it anymore like i don't like doing old songs he was like and he, he this is him he's saying i've been there man like i know exactly what you mean i've been there where i don't want to do those songs I, blah 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 but he said but you're a grown man you signed up to do these shows so do them just like that and so that conversation made me have to re figure out how can I make these shows exciting to me? Mm-hmm. You know, how can I be in it? And that's when the idea to try to put messages on my uniform every night, where are that's those, what got me excited. Where are those uniforms? Uh, we have them in storage. All of them? All of them. Okay. So my biggest excitement of that tour was figuring out what I was going to say that night. Because I was trying to say something new. Like, I love, I mean, here's my thing. I love the blessing of the songs that we've been given. I don't like performing old songs. Really. I just I just don't because I'm in a whole other space and I have to kind of get back in a remember what that felt like to do that. And I don't necessarily like doing that. It's almost like playing dress up mm-hmm. to an eighth grade picture that you saw. And now you're trying to re-be that person again. Right. And so I was trying to figure out um, how do I make this exciting, this tour? And so the messages on the, the suits were just fun to me. It was just hilarious. What can I do to to make it fun? That's how fun. I, that's how I got through it, and that gave me something, an entry way to make this exciting. And that's um, yeah. Oh, oh, but but back to back to Prince. Another thing too. So when I was telling him about um, you know um, uh, how I felt, and he was like, "Yeah, I've been there. I've been there." He's like, "But you got to do these shows. You're a grown man." And then he said, um, um. Oh, oh, so back when he was like, um, you got to remind people who you are. He's like, when you've been gone for a long time, you have to remind people who you are every time. He's like, you got to do that first. This is him telling me, like, you got to do that first, and then you can do whatever. He actually said, if you remind people what you do first, you can shave off all your hair and tell them to do it, and they will do it. This is what this is. These are his words. Mm-hmm. And he said, I learned that from Mary J. Blige. This is Prince telling me. He's like, I toured, I did a couple of shows with her, and I'm trying to do all this new stuff. And she's doing what people know. And he said, I learned that from Mary uh, to give the people what they want first. Then you can do whatever you want after that. 
and him trying to, I guess, plead his case about reminding people who y'all are, he started naming artists. And I won't name the names because I, I don't think it's about these names. Mm-hmm. But he was like, this person, this person, this person, none of these people would be here if it wasn't for y'all. And you have to remember that. And you have to remind people of that all the time. So, um, and then he said, uh, and this is, I guess, the musician in him. He was like, and why you didn't play your guitar on Hey on stage? Why you didn't do it? I was like, I'm not like a great guitarist or anything. You know, it's like, I, I know how to play a couple of chords. He's like, but you're good enough. You should have played it. Right. So, he, you know, he digging it. And then... I didn't tell everybody at the time because I wanted to keep the uh, momentum together, but he totally dissed our band. Right. Yeah. He's like, and what's up with that fucking band? This is Prince saying, what's up with that fucking band? And at that point, I was like, ah, man, you know, I really didn't want a band. You know, I was trying to find a new way to be modern looking on stage or something like that. Anyway, Mm -hmm. I said, but, you know, I'm in a group and, you know. We have to be fair about decisions. And I'm telling Prince about mm-hmm. my inner, you know, <laughs> right. my, my inner decision with me and Big, you know, Big, like, I want the band, the band, you know, shit. That's, you know, these are our folks who are supporting our band, which I'm with on that. But I wanted to do something new, but we are together in this thing. So we had, we made decision to do the band. And it was our first night. So we're trying to get as tight as we can be. But anyway, right. he was like, what's up with that band? They sound horrible. Uh, yeah, that's all I remember from that conversation. But yeah, brother, you know, I I just want to say that I've been a long time, long, long, long time fan of yours. One of my prime career regrets in the in the early start is that we never got to shop it up or 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 like work together. Then in the 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 what I call the fossil years. Yeah. <laughs> We started our careers thirty years ago, folks. Um, but man, you, you, no, but you, you're an inspiration in terms of like pushing boundaries, because you know a lot of us are are walking out here sort of mired in self doubt. Mm. You know, thinking of survival first. Uh, all right, I gotta get, I gotta bring this money in so I can, you know, help yeah. my mom out. Yeah. And da, 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 yeah. Obligations and stuff like that, and we never allow ourselves to like break free and dream and take risks and do these things. And, you know, you've proven time and time again that there is a payoff when you do listen to your heart and not, I'm a brain person. I used to be a brain person where I'm always thinking of fight or flight, survival first, that sort of thing. And not, what do I really feel? Yeah. And yeah, man, with new blue, man, dude, it couldn't have come at a better time in my life because that's the type of music I always listen to. Mm, just to mm, calm down. Yeah. Just to twenty four seven. That's all I listen to. Yeah. I listen to like tones and all those things, man. So no man, thank you, man. I, no, I appreciate man, you giving I'm, I'm glad that it's it's useful for you, man. Like I'm just happy to be a, a part of that this time. You know, mm. I mean you you set an intention and you never know where it's gonna land. Like my idea of what people are calling the flute album, which I I, I think is I think it belittles it to call it a flute album. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not just a flute. I, I do play flute on it a bit. I play electronic flute on it, uh, but it's it's just it's, it's just music, right. man. It's just music. But can I ask you something? Mm-hmm. Have you heard from Stevie Wonder yet? Because no, I haven't. To me, this reminds me. So my father and I, uh, our bond was always bin shopping records. Yeah, I grew up in a household with like three thousand records, yeah. and so. Once a month, we just go bin shopping and everything. And one day in 1979, he comes home with uh, Stevie Wonder's Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants album, mm-hmm. which is like a three-year follow-up to Songs in the Key of Life. Mm-hmm. Songs in the Key of Life was like one of those events, like Thriller, you know, yeah. everyone had to yeah. have it in the household yeah. and we're listening to it together as a family, it brought the family together. And so we're waiting three years for this follow-up record and- the look of utter disappointment on my dad's face where he's like, Stevie Wonder doesn't even sing until like the fourth song. And he couldn't get it. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. eight years old in 79. So I've never had a, a dark side of the moon psychedelic experience. So for me, I'm putting my headphones on and I'm like imagining space and all these things. Yeah, and yeah. So I totally took that record different. I think that for... Um, a new generation, 
that this is going to be that for them. Like for me, I use it for meditative and sleeping purposes. Mm. Cause I've heard a lot of that, man. Like I used to sleep to the news, yeah, especially with the past administration. Yeah. And it's just unhealthy to have that bombardment. MSC, MBC yeah. on like 24 mm-hmm. seven and yeah. all the bad news. So then I started sleeping to that. And when you're soundtrack, oh man, that to me, that was everything. So I, I thank you for that, man. Man, I'm so it. happy that you, you, you're finding use and people are finding use in it. Like it's, it's become a thing that people are actually using. Like, yeah, it's a it's tool. Like I, I have to be in traffic. So I put this album on and I'm not mad anymore. Yes. You know, like, so I'm happy that I'm a, I'm a part of of something that can contribute positively to somebody's life. You know what I mean? Like, and the sleep and the sleep thing is really important because I've read like a lot of people are like, man, I don't really sleep, and I've gotten the best sleep in the last three days after listening to the album. So to me, I'm just happy that it's it's working in that in that way too, and not just on a, you know, oh, this is a moment, and he's a rapper, and he made this flute thing. You know, like beyond beyond that. You know, and 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 I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm upset that people are upset, but I I understand because if you've been waiting for a thing for 17 years, which I haven't been waiting for a thing, that's that's the that's the difference. Mm-hmm. I've never said, hey, I'm about to put this solo album out. Hey, I'm about to put this solo album out. I'm about I didn't do that for 17 years, mm-hmm. so I I didn't see it the same as like when I put it out. I forgot. Oh, it has been 17 years, so I didn't see it as hey, fuck y'all. Listen to this. I just saw this. This is where I am right now. You know, put it out. Uh, I, I didn't think that it would um, have have as wide of wings as it's had. Um, are but you, I'm happy for it. Are though. you planning on the visual aspect of it now? Are you trying to figure out how to present this live, either by film or some sort? Like what Solange well, used to do, take over museums and both, both, both. We uh we did shoot a film to it uh that's gonna be playing mid December. Okay. Uh, very simple kind of thing. Uh, it's gonna be in IMAX theaters. Um, so you have a visual to it, but live, man, like that's what I'm really looking forward to because that's honestly that's the kind of jewel and and the magic in it. Just kind of like the feeding off of each other and making that thing. You know, it's kind of like watching a formation like and we don't know especially i'm not a trained musician so it's even more surprising to me when a note comes out or <laughs> something falls a certain way you're like ah. when it lands right right and you don't and you don't know it like i don't know um like music theory wise to make something land i only know how to land because i jumped up before it <laughs> you, you know what i mean like right so that's that's the only way that i know so Doing it live and actually doing music with these brothers, like that's the fun, and I and I can't wait for people to experience in a room watching us do it. Do it, you know what I mean? So that's yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, let's have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of my fellow Questlove Supremers, Laia and Fontigolo and Unpay Bill, and it's your birthday today as we do this. Uh, shout out to Brian and cousin Jake and Brittany as well on the home front. Uh, once again, the great Andre 3000 on Quest Love Supreme. Uh, and we'll see you on the next go round. Thank you, brother. Appreciate hey. it. No, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Quest Love Supreme, hosted by Amir Quest Love Thompson, Aya St. Clair, Fonte Coleman, Sugar Steve Mandel, and unpaid Bill Sherman. The executive producers are Amir Quest Love Thompson, Sean G. Brian Calhoun, produced by Brittany Benjamin, Cousin Jake Payne, Elias St. Clair, edited by Alex Conroy, produced by iHeart by Noel Brown and Mike Johns. This episode was engineered by Trevor Young. What's Love Supreme is a production of iHeart Radio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.